Tom, the recent physics experiments that you've proposed are set up such that the results will show and support that this is a virtual reality. One of the most interesting things you have said about virtual reality is that it supports spirituality and that materialism doesn't. If you could elaborate on that. Oh, sure. The experiments are significant in that they will do two things. They will kind of verify that indeed this is a virtual reality because if the experiments work the way I expect they will, or the way I hope they will, and of course no one ever knows until the experiment's done exactly how they will come out, but if they work as I expect they will, or as my understanding is, then there will be no other way to explain them other than that this is a virtual reality. The things that will happen in the experiments will be only explainable from the perspective of virtual reality. So in that way, we kind of, of uh, create a very strong evidential background for the case that we indeed are living in a virtual reality. The second thing that these experiments will do is that they, they will rewrite the fundamentals of science, and not just physics, but science in general. They're going to rewrite the fundamentals of philosophy. It, what I've done is I've taken the My Big Toe virtual reality concepts, the way that My Big Toe has developed virtual reality and the nature of virtual reality and the aspects of virtual reality and how virtual reality works and how the virtual reality is connected to consciousness and, and, uh, and how consciousness is really the choice maker and so on, that, that the, the system, the answer to Fredrickson's question of, you know, what and where is other is that consciousness is other. There is a larger conscious system. So once you make those assumptions, then there's certain logical ramifications of those assumptions. And one of those logical ramifications is that you can use those assumptions of virtual reality to restructure quantum mechanics. You can look at quantum mechanics, you can look at the double slit, you can look at other, all the quantum mechanics, and you can understand logically what's going on and why they work the way they work. Now that's a big change over the way it is now. Now no one understands quantum mechanics. They do not understand why it works the way it works. Um, quantum mechanics is simply calculation. You know, that's the shut up and calculate, you know, that, that we've, famous statement that we've uh, all heard. What that means is it doesn't make sense. We can't logically describe what's going on, but we can calculate what the answers are if we employ these sorts of ideas in our calculations. So quantum mechanics now is weird science that can only be calculated but can't be understood logically. Well, if you look at it from virtual reality viewpoint, that's no longer the case. From a virtual reality viewpoint, quantum mechanics can be understood, understood logically, and you don't need to calculate to determine what the answer is going to be. All you have to see is the logic of the experiment and understand the nature of reality, virtual reality, and then you can just logically step through it and say, well, here's what the result's going to be rather than have to, you know, do pages and pages of pages of computation um, or calculations really in computers. It's a lot of very complex computations in order to determine what the result's going to be. So it puts, it puts quantum mechanics on a logical basis that's understood. And when that happens, everything else will change with it. You see, because if it makes physics work, you see, if the idea of virtual reality actually is better physics, and that's demonstrated by experiment, then that'll change the foundation 
of everything else in science because physics is at the base of the scientific pyramid. First you have physics and physics has the tool of mathematics. Mathematics is simply the logic of quantity. So we take physics with the tool of logic, the logic of quantity, and it describes the world. And physics talks about elementary particles, it talks about nuclei and atoms and so on, and eventually as you build that up, then you create chemistry out of physics, because chemistry starts with atoms and molecules and how those combine. But physics describes those atoms and molecules. So we actually have, if you want to make the hierarchy of the pyramids, you have math at the bottom, which is the tool, the logic of quantity. On that you have physics that understands how that logic applies to, the, to our world. And then you build up higher, higher aggregations, I guess, and end up next with chemistry which is now looking at atoms and molecules and how those interact as opposed to how nuclei and electrons and protons and other things interact, you know, particles. And then once you get above chemistry is biology. How does all that biochemistry, you know, that the chemistry of biology, if you will, the cells, chemistry of the cells, how does all that work? So that's the next level up. That's built on chemistry, biochemistry, for the most part. So then you get to our perception as part of biology. Our perception then tells us what we see and feel and hear and think, you see, which then creates our concept of reality. So physics is at the very bottom level of that. And if you have a major change in the way you approach physics, if the reality changes at the physics level, then everything up through chemistry and biology and our perception and sense of the universe, all of that changes overnight. As well philosophy, as well metaphysics, as well theology. All those things will now have their, that their basis, their assumptions at the very bottom, assumptions at the root, will be changed. So that's going to make a very big change, a very big dent in business as usual as far as the way we understand the world, okay? So that's why it's kind of a big, you know, why, it, why it's the big deal because uh, we're talking about things that are very, very fundamental. So when you have changes in things that are very fundamental, then those changes ripple through all those things that are dependent on those fundamental assumptions. Well, our fundamental assumption now is one that Newton left us with, that this is a big you know, clockwork universe, that uh, it's a big machine, that if it's deterministic, if we knew where all the parts were and what they were doing at any particular time, then we could compute what it does at any later time. That kind of an attitude, that's the attitude of science. And that has become the, the root of most of the rest of our sense of how reality works, is based on that fundamental concept. That fundamental concept is what, about 200 years old or so. It's not that old, it's a few hundred years old, maybe even 250. But it uh, has dominated for as long as most of us have been alive, who are still alive today. You know, that's been the dominant concept. So this will make a big change. It will answer Fredkin's question of what's other. And once you open that up, that there is, that we in our physical, re in this, what we call our physical reality, that we are really um, a product of something more fundamental. You see, we are not the fundamental, you know, material world is not fundamental in itself. It's a product of something else that's fundamental, and that something else is consciousness. That may seem like just an intellectual argument that really, who cares, you know, but it will change everything in science and even in uh, other things, even in philosophy and metaphysics and theology, 
even literature, the way we look at you know our stories, that'll change a lot. So that's where that's why these experiments are important and why they are um, kind of at the at the root of the way we see who we are, why we are, why we're here, what the point is, um, what's next, death, you know, what does that mean? All of these big questions are all wrapped up in this assumption. So that's why it's important. And you had a second part of your question. Well, the fact that consciousness is fundamental rather than this reality is fundamental, that lends itself to the spirituality aspect. Yes, that's where the spiritual connection comes from because, you know, what is, how do you define what is spiritual? Well, I think the definition of what we consider spiritual is that stuff that is about the core of us, our quality, you know, who we are, what can we become, what should we become, what is morality and ethics, what's the root of morality and ethics, how does one know what's right and what's wrong in a very confusing world, is it all just uh, uh, circumstantial, relative, or are there some fundamentals to it? Well, you find out if you understand that you know, the nature of reality being consciousness at the root, that there are some fundamentals. The right and wrong is not just relative. There are fundamentals that are just right and others that are wrong, and it has to do with long-term entropy, creation or reduction. So the spiritual is what we call spiritual from our perspective here in this, this virtual reality of ours is really an understanding of consciousness. It's an understanding of who we are at the level beyond the physical, you know, what we call physical, which is really our virtual reality. You know, what's, what's beyond that? That's the definition of spiritual. It's us beyond the physical. Who are we? What are we? What are our goals and missions and purposes beyond just interacting here in the physical? That's the very definition of what spirituality is. So this concept, uh, not only is it going to change physics, which will change chemistry, which will change biology, which will change philosophy, you see, which will change metaphysics, which will change theology, you know, it changes all of these things. It's also going to make the spiritual component of our life real, up front and center not something that you do once a week, you know, on a Sunday afternoon or something that, uh, you know, that philosophers can chat about but really doesn't have any solid meaning. Uh, some, it's not that sort of thing. It's core to our being. We are spiritual beings. That's the same to say as we are beings of consciousness. We are consciousness. So those two things are really similar. So the idea that I'm using these experiments to challenge physics. The concept here is to make our sense of what is right and what is wrong, our sense of who are we in our spiritual dimension, in our dimension that's bigger than the physical, that's really where it's going. That's what makes it important. The change in physics wouldn't be that important all by itself. That would just be relegated to this physical reality and our understanding of it and like, well, you know, who really cares? Because what's important is something bigger, us at the core. Who are we? What should we do? What's the difference between right and wrong? And how do I know what that difference is? Um, you know, what, what should be my goals? Where's my growth? What's my quality? These are all spiritual questions. And this, um, these experiments are really leading to a whole new concept of spirituality, as well as a whole new concept of what this physical reality is all about and how does it work. So it all goes together. You can't really separate those two. It's not that you have the spiritual world and spiritual concerns over here and the physical world and physical concerns over there, and the two are really separate. That's been a problem that we've had for the last couple of hundred years. 
that's a really big problem because when you can separate the spiritual from the physical, then you've got this point, well, in this physical reality, we can do anything we want. There is no right and wrong. It's whatever we make it, you know. It's whatever the law says. And as long as it's not illegal, then it's okay. That defines right. You can get away with it. Well, that has nothing to do with the morality. See, laws are made up by people. It's nothing to do with a more fundamental spiritual or, or, or uh, understanding of, the, of what's right and wrong on a more fundamental level. So we've separated those two. So that gives us free reign to be, you know, not very nice people, very low quality people, because that's just in the, what do we call it, the secular section. And that's okay. That's where you have to be. If you're going to be in business, you got to be cutthroat. You got to be able to, you know, eliminate your competition. You need to know how to, how to, how to fight and win. You need to, you know, play tricks on your customers to get them to be your customers and get their money as best you can. So we have this totally different idea. And then we have the spiritual side, which we pay lip service to, you know, once a week or something and say, oh, yes, yeah, spiritual love, peace. It's all very nice. Yeah, everybody loves love. Everybody loves peace. Everybody wants us all to live happily ever after together as one big family. That's very nice. Now let's go back to business in the real world, you know, where I, you know, s screw my customers and, you know, uh, you know, write my, um, Produ no, my what suppliers and you know take advantage of everybody I can take advantage of to get as much as I can get because that's secular that's what we do over there and if you don't do that you'll be ground up well these two are separate in our minds and basically in Western culture the spiritual side of it is kind of the minor side that we dabble with occasionally some people get wound up about it, but they're in the minority. Most of us live in this secular world where that spiritual stuff seems like the woo-woo stuff that you know, only people with weak minds that will believe anything do. And that's led to a lot of our bad behavior. So finding out that it's really all one system and that consciousness is at the core means that spirituality, right and wrong, entropy going up or entropy going down is at the core of us and it's not a separate thing. This physical reality is really a virtual reality here for us to increase our quality. It's all very much related. So just that idea by itself, you see, will have a lot of power in the world if people start to see it as a whole thing. If the spiritual component of it becomes just as real and important when it actually it's more real and more important, actually, but it becomes at least real and important, that's a huge change in the mind frame of people. So I think it's hard to underestimate the impact that a couple of physics experiments might have over the next you know, 20 years or 30 years. Could be dramatic, and maybe we're not ready for it yet. Maybe we are. If we is we, well now my we is humanity. If, if we humanity are ready for it, changes will come quickly. And maybe in a decade or two, we'll be living in a totally different place. If we're not ready for it, which means we basically just deny it and struggle with it, then it'll take longer. But eventually we'll grow up and be ready for it and the roots will already have been laid, the understanding will be there, and when we are ready, it will come quickly. A lot of things about materialism are the denial of things, such as the denial of how the double slit experiment works and what the results are. So I can see clearly your, your viewpoint and Let's hope for good results on your physical experiments. Yes, let's hope for. I, th you know, I'm a scientist, so I'm never at a hundred percent. I'm always have some, you know, my mind's always open, and the possibility that things are different than I think is always a real possibility. I'm not a, a, a probability equals 1.0 kind of 
person, and I don't think any good scientist is. You always have to uh, be skeptical of how much you really know and how much you just think you know, but don't really. And I'm like that, of course, but I think they have a good chance of working. You know, you're never sure because even though a lot of things logically fall into place based on these, these ideas that are kind of represented in these experiments, a lot of things fall into place. But then there's a lot of things we just don't know, you know, that, uh, that are guesses on my part, but they're not just random guesses, they're, they're informed guesses, and that is that the larger conscious system generally has two or three or four, has multiple ways in which it can do something, in which it can produce a result. I mean, this is, this is um, like in programming. If you're writing a simulation or a program, there's always three or four different ways that you can write the code to get the same result. The difference is that some are just more efficient than others. Some are more are quicker to write down. Some, you know, would are longer. Some take a thousand lines of code. Others could be done in just fifty lines of code, and it would accomplish the same thing. So my thought was that what the larger conscious system would do and how it would implement this virtual reality would be with the most efficient code, the most efficient process possible. That if there were less efficient processes, it would have learned by now what those were and you know, upgraded them to more efficient processes. So that's been one of my key ideas in figuring the system out. I look for what would be the most efficient way for consciousness to accomplish this rendering, if you will, of this virtual reality. What would be the rules? You wouldn't want the rules to be changeable. You wouldn't want you know, our reality to have different fundamental aspects from you know, time to time. It has to be something that would work in general and then you stick to it. There's different ways that they could do that. I've assumed the most efficient way that I could see and that's how I've derived my concepts of the virtual reality and that's how I've uh, derive these experiments. Now, the error could be that there is a more efficient way than what I can see. Well, then I could be wrong and there may be some other way that's even more efficient, although if there is, I just don't see that. And also another um, way would be that if there were some reason why a less efficient way would be used, some other reason, why would one choose to be inefficient well, maybe to avoid a very particular problem in the, in the reality. Maybe you choose something that was less efficient because somehow it worked better in this circumstance. Well, if that were the case, then the things that I've said about virtue I may not be right either. But see, so there's those possibilities. That's why I don't say that this is a, a probability of one that my experience is going to work this way. But I think it's more, at least, it's at least an 80, 85% that, the mo that I do understand what the most efficient path is and that uh, the system will indeed stick with that path even if that forces it to give up some of its secrets, if you will. You see, that's what the double slit experiment did. It was an experiment. When we sent those particles at those double slits one at a time, we forced the system to give up one of its secrets. It showed us that those particles would, for some seemingly magical reason, array themselves in a, in a diffraction pattern on the other side, even though they just went in one at a time. They would, once going through the slits, they just arrange themselves in a diffraction pattern. See, that's the nobody will ever understand it, just shut up and calculate moment because particles just don't arrange themselves in a pattern for no particular reason. But in this experiment, they seemed to do that. And that was the larger consciousness system. We put it between a rock and a hard place by sending those particles at two slits, one at a time, forcing its hand to choose how it would implement us doing that. And it chose to stick with 
a consistent implementation. So because it had waves already, it had to create a result that was not in opposition to what we already knew about waves. It had to marry those two. It was a boundary value problem and it had to keep that boundary between waves and particles smooth. And the way it chose to do that is using its normal probability and making the uh, particles distribute themselves in a diffraction pattern. So that kind of gave us a, aha, look at this. Now we see a little bit better how the system works. We forced it to give us a secret. And I think that's what I'm going to do with these experiments. Experiments number, I think it's number two, number four, and number five uh, are going to be the ones that really rewrite quantum mechanics and rewrite science. Uh, experiment number three is then, if, 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 if any of the two, four and five, prove to be correct, then three does some analysis around the man in the loop, why the observer is key. You know, what's, what is it with the experiment only works this way if there is an observer? So it studies kind of the, the, the human interface or the man interface with the mechanics of creating the reality. <clears throat> and of course those are created, we have that interface because in our virtual reality you have to have a player. You have to have a consciousness, you see. The virtual reality doesn't work without a consciousness. You have to have a computer to compute it and you have to have a consciousness player to play it. Without the player, there's no point in computing it. Without the computing it, the player doesn't have a virtual reality to play in. So those two things are logically necessary for each other. So in order to create this virtual reality, it's predicated on having a player. Well, that player turns out to be the observer in the quantum mechanics experiment. So you have to have an observer. Without the observer, nothing's computed. So if an observer doesn't get information, then the process is never computed. There's no point. Computer in a virtual reality doesn't just compute things for the fun of it. It computes them so it can send them to a player. That's why the observer in, in the double slit experiment is important. It's that consciousness connection. And that's the secret that was divulged when we forced Mother Nature to put us, you know, to, to uh, tell us what would happen when we sent one particle a time at double slits. So my experiments are also going to force uh, the larger conscious system to divulge a couple of more of her secrets because it's going to put, it's going to put the larger kinds of system between a rock and a hard place, forcing it to show us a little of the magic behind, you know, behind the curtain. What goes on behind the curtain? And uh, that's really what it's all about. So that's what these experiments do. They kind of back the larger consciousness system, or if you want to rather say the, the virtual reality rendering engine. You know, they force this process of rendering this virtual reality to divulge some of its secrets by backing it into a corner from which it can't escape without giving us a secret. So that's basically what these experiments are all about. <laughs> You're not supposed to trick Mother Nature, but every once in a while you have to in order to get her to, to give up one of her secrets. Well, if you're giving the physicists and the scientists an opportunity to conduct these experiments, if they look, they will get the information. According to the rules, they should get the information. And this being an efficient system, that sort of corresponds to mm -hmm. your concept yeah. of how this will work. So if, if, it's, if I have it right, then it will be a very dramatic set of experiments that will be done and redone and redone again to make sure there's no mistakes. And it will make a very big deal. If I'm wrong, then I will learn something about how the system works and how the reality is, is put together. You see, if, if I'm wrong, that's not like a disaster at all. I can't lose here because then neither can anybody else. If, you're, if I'm wrong about it, then I'll learn some things that I'll see that the reality is constructed in 
a way different than I thought, and then I can start working on trying to understand that. So there's a win, win, win for me in, in either case. Um, the idea that this is a virtual reality, the idea that consciousness is a computer, the idea that love is the answer, all the fundamentals aren't dependent on these experiments working. You see, it, all that stuff stands whether these experiments work or not. What's dependent on these experiments, whether they work or not, is whether or not my sense of how consciousness, the big computer, if you will, how it generates this virtual reality, kind of the rules behind the reality, if you will, the, the process of generating reality, whether that's right or not. That's really what these experiments hinge on. So it's not a matter that MBT is on the line or at stake here. It's a matter of what MBT says about how the virtual reality is created, the mechanics of creation of the virtual reality. That's really what's on the line. And I feel like I'm right, but we'll see. It's, uh, it's really important, I think, to find out and to move forward. Either way, it's going to be a win for, uh, you know, for me and for everybody else in the sense that uh, every experiment gives you more information of which you can better, you know, go forward. So I'm really looking forward to it. I've laid them all out there and I'm hoping that within a year, at least, maybe two at the most, we'll find some experimenters who are willing to take these on and see how they work. Particularly the number, experiment number two, it's a very simple one. Uh, it just doesn't take a whole lot of effort or money or anything else. You know, the others are more complex, but that one is so simple that surely somebody will just do that just because, you see. And if that works, then of course the others then will be done to see if they too will work. So it does have a simple one as a, almost like a, you know, a, a leader, you know, how you, uh, put something out there that makes it easy, easy for people to take the first step, well, that one experiment is that. It's, a, it's kind of a, uh, a leader that is simple, but will be a, a, a big, big surprise to uh, scientists if it does exactly what I say it does. So we'll see. Well, thank you, Tom. And thank you also to those who will take on these experiments. They will be part of history and part of possibly rewriting quantum mechanics. And everything else. And everything else. <laughs> yes. So appropriate for mm -hmm. a big theory of everything. Yes, if it's a theory of everything, <laughs> it then has it, to. it has to be at the root. You know, you talk about things that, if it's a theory of everything, then you're talking about things that are very fundamental, not things that are derived further down the logical chain, but things that are very fundamental. And fundamental things will change everything. That's, the, that's what fundamental means. Thank you, Tom.